the Dallas Mavericks are 9-1 in their last 10 and are getting hot at the right time. Luka and Kyrie have finally been given the time to click, and they even have a top defense in this stretch. I made a video a little while ago about Luka's MVP candidacy, and the Mavs are putting themselves in position for Luka to have a real shot at it. I love the Mavs deadline moves, and the pieces are finally all coming together in Dallas. The Western Conference is extremely deep, but with a best in the world level player, a great co-star, and now a decent supporting cast, the Mavs will make any series interesting. The injury riddled Mavs are finally healthy and they are looking scary. Today I'm going to be going over this Mavs hot streak, why Luka is the MVP, and what I expect come playoff time. Before we get into this, if y'all could like the video, sub the channel, and hit that noti bell, I would really, really appreciate it. It would help me out a ton, and without further ado, let's get right into the video. As I said, the Mavs are 9-1 in their last 10, with the only loss being to the number 2 seeded Oklahoma City Thunder without Luka. The first game of this run, which I was actually in attendance for, was a close home win against the Miami Heat. I believe this was a turning point for the Mavs. After a somewhat embarrassing home loss against the Pacers a few days before, which I was also in attendance for, I went to Dallas, you know, a little, little Dallas trip, whatever, the Mavs got a nice win over Miami and never looked back. Seeing Luka angry on the bench during that Indiana game made me think they need to turn this around now. Guys like Luka do not come around and putting having one in any kind of jeopardy is stupid. I didn't think Luka would leave, but I also thought and still think it's incredibly stupid to leave that up to any sort of chance. While they didn't make any major star move, this had to be irritating for Dallas after all of the supplemental moves they made. I really thought these moves fit what was needed in Dallas, and we're seeing that on full display right now. I will be discussing some guys down the line, but the best way to me to encapsulate the impact of role players in Dallas is how elite they've been defensively recently. Over the past 10 games, the Dallas Mavericks have the second best defense in basketball with a defensive rating of 107.4 placing them right between the Knicks at 104.5 and the Magic at 108.9. Getting Luka some long perimeter defenders and rim protection has been my dream forever, and we are finally getting to see what that looks like. While Gafford has somewhat taken the reins of late, having him and Lively as your center rotation is the center of all this. No? Okay. You need many great defensive games to have the second best defense over a 10 game stretch, but I want to key in on the national TV masterpiece of a game that culminated in Kyrie's running hook against the Nuggets. In this game, the Mavs held the defending champion Nuggets to 105 points and neutralized Jokic and Murray in many ways. Jokic ended with 16, 11, and 7 on 6 for 16 shooting with 3 turnovers, a pretty awful game for his standards, and Murray put up 23 but shot 7 for 20 from the field. The Mavericks also just held the high-powered Kings offense to just 96 points in a blowout victory last night. The Mavs have a great blend of size and athleticism on defense, and while I don't know if we can expect them to maintain being the league's second best defense, I think they are more than capable of being at least decent. The Mavs, and Luka in particular, have also shown ability to play with pace, which can be frustrating at times, but personally I would always prefer to get the most shots up in a league like this. We saw this on full display during the Denver game as the Mavs took 100 shots to the Nuggets 84 while only taking one less free throw. The game does slow down in the playoffs and we know Luka is capable of playing like that, but being able to play at multiple speeds is something that will also bode well for Dallas in the postseason. An interesting part of this Mavs hot streak to me is how the stats of their stars don't look as wowing as they have been. Don't get me wrong, Luka is still averaging a 31 point triple double but he averages almost a 34-point triple-double. This, to me, though, is not an indictment of Luka and Kyrie, but rather the front office. They're not winning because Luka stopped ball-hogging, which never made any sense for a generational playmaker, but anyways, they're winning because Luka doesn't have to carry the load. There is finally a competent team in Dallas that allows for Luka's unreal impact to result in wins. Everyone loves to point at the head of something when things go south, when oftentimes they are not at fault. It's not unexpected from the casual fan who thinks superstars decide if they want to win games or not, but hopefully we can begin to change that narrative. I know when Luka gets his, in hindsight, everyone is going to act like they always said it wasn't his fault, but I won't forget. If you want to hear more, be sure to go check out my video centered on Luka, but now I will make his MVP case again. 34, 9, and 10 on 49, 37, 79 for a true shooting of 61.5% on a team that is currently the sixth seed and is a game out of fifth and a game and a half out of fourth. I understand the seeding precedent, except that has been ignored multiple times recently due to insane statistical feats. As I said, I basically made an entire video on this topic, but I want to leave you with my main point from that video. If Luka was averaging 0.9 more rebounds and 0.2 more assists to officially have a 34-point triple-double average, one, do you think narrative would change, and two, is that logical? Are those statistical differences really all that indicative of anything? 
I know the narrative would suddenly shift if this happened, and it honestly makes no sense. If Luka remains a top six seed and does not win MVP, it will be a travesty. There are a few worthy candidates, but I really think Luka deserves it. If he's in the play-in, I can't really argue, but if he is in that top six, I really don't know why we can't make an exception for him like we did Russ and Jokic. Kyrie Irving has been a huge part of this Dallas team finally putting it all together. Like Luka, his stats haven't quite been his season numbers during this stretch, but his impact is still there. Luka and Kyrie have also built great synergy due to them finally having time. I understand the backlash for missing the play-in, but the constant suggestion that this duo didn't work after they had played maybe 20 games together was funny. Yes, they are two guards who excel with the ball, but they can still play off of each other and terrorize a defense. Think about having to game plan for a guy who gives you a 30-point triple-double any night, and then having to worry about one of the most crafty and dynamic scorers the game has ever seen. As we saw in that Denver game, Luka and Kyrie in crunch time are two of the coldest killers in the game. Having not one but two elite closers will be huge for Dallas in the playoffs, and Luka and Kyrie's abilities further emphasize how this team can play at different paces. Luka and Kyrie finally had the time to mesh and understand playing with each other, and what we are seeing on the court right now is the result of that. Kyrie and Luka are the faces of the Mavs, but they can't do it alone. The Mavs realized this and made two big role player moves at the deadline, acquiring Daniel Gafford and PJ Washington. While PJ hasn't been great offensively so far, I want to take a moment to talk about Daniel Gafford. I always loved the way Gafford fit, especially with Luka and the Mavs, but this move somewhat confused me initially due to Derek Lively's existence, but with how young he is, having some of the weight lifted off of his shoulders is good. The defense from Gafford is solid, but offensively is where Daniel Gafford has been excelling. He broke an NBA record for consecutive field goals made, and what I mean by this is that he was within three makes of breaking Wilt Chamberlain's record of 35. Playing with Luka has done wonders for Gafford, and even after his streak ended, Daniel has been unreal. Over this 9-1 Mavs stretch, Daniel Gafford is averaging 15 points, 8 rebounds, and 2 assists with 2 blocks on 84.2% from the field and 69.2% from the line for a true shooting percentage of 83.5% in just 24 and a half minutes a night. Gafford has been amazing and exactly the roller Luka has been longing for. This creates an interesting caveat with your future with Derek Lively, but this is a problem I would love to have. The rest of the Mavs roster is a great blend of shooting size, athleticism, and defense. You have another ball handler who's having a career resurgence in Dante Exum, a Swiss Army knife and shooter in Josh Green, a high volume three point shooter in Tim Hardaway Jr., athletic lob threats in Lively and DJJ, and bigger defenders in Maxi and PJ. No team is perfect, but the Mavs have done a decent job of putting quality role players around their stars. I would love to give each of these guys their shine, but this isn't a three part docuseries, unfortunately. But I do want to discuss Derek Lively. The addition of Gafford complicated his playing time, but he is elite when he plays and has immense potential. I strongly anticipated and recommended that the Mavs trade their pick last year, but I was okay with them keeping it when they took Lively. Now yes, playing with Luka helps, but this man is a rookie shooting over 75% from the field. I am also aware that all of his shots are layups and dunks, but this is still unbelievable and I haven't even begun discussing his defense. With Gafford on such a phenomenal contract, they will and should both stay in Dallas until you have to pay one, but I just wanted to give Lively his shine because he's been pushed into the background a little bit. To wrap this up, this Mavs team is yet another legit threat in the Western Conference. Setting expectations is hard because of how deep the West is, but the Mavs should at least go to 6 or 7 with just about anyone. First round exit by itself sounds bad, but I'd argue at least 6 if not 7 or 8 of the top 10 seeds in the West have the talent to win a playoff series but they obviously all can't. Basically, I think the Mavs will win their first round series, but if they were to match up with, for example, the Wolves and lose, I wouldn't be surprised. It's a scary place to be as a fan of a team, but a great place for fans around the league. Parity is as even as ever, and we should have a very interesting playoffs. The Mavs have put themselves in a great position, not only right now, but for the future as well. They have a number of very good and tradable contracts. Their draft assets are almost completely depleted, but in a sign and trade scenario, the Mavs can definitely make it worth the other team's while. No matter what they do from here, the Mavs core is here and should be elite for years to come. That's going to wrap this one up. If y'all enjoyed it, please like it up, sub the channel, and hit that noti bud. Really, really appreciate it. It does help me out a ton. And comment down below, you know, what you think, you know, again, if you think, you know, you know, MVP, the MVP thing, you know, like Giannis, Shea, Jokic are all worthy candidates. It's fine. Like I'm, if, if they win, like I can't really get mad at it. But it's the fact that Luka's like an outsider in this conversation. And that's the main part of my other Luka video, which went crazy, by the way. Thank y'all for that. I mean, I don't know. There, there might be some overlap, actually, with, you know, with people coming from, or, you know, people who saw that video. 
people coming to this one. And if you know, if, if you're still here watching this and you watch that other video and you still haven't hit that red button, like, come on, bro. Like, you know, like, I don't know, bro. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at my Xbox controller right now. If you're still watching, comment Xbox. I rock with you. And I'm going to wrap this up. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.